My name is Doji, and I am going to go ahead and be giving you a talk on just some basics for web design, some ways that you can get into it, and some things that you can do so that it doesn't feel like this foreign thing, so that design doesn't feel like something that is unapproachable except for the best of all the best designers. Really quick, uh, my name is Doji. My parents are from Ghana, and that's why my name is the way it is. The D, Z is a J. I was born in Oklahoma, though, which is kind of cool. I, am, I work as a volunteer for an organization called the Interaction Design Foundation. And what they do is their goal is to really promote design education, especially UX design and human-computer interaction. And I work as the local leader in the Oklahoma area. I'm just trying to gather people together regularly to talk about design topics and to really tell them it's not this thing that cannot be approached, that everyone can actually do it. And you just need to learn about the basics and you can slowly work your way up from there. I use Zurb Foundation as a framework for doing web design and web pages. I like it a lot, so if I lean towards pushing Zurb, that's the reason why. It isn't because it's the best, it's just I like it. That's about it. Find what you like, use it. And I'm also a Techlahoma volunteer as well. So from here on out, I'll be helping with some other organizations here at Techlahoma where we're going to be getting together and once again trying to bridge between tech, the development, and then the design part as well. There'll be announcements about that later on, so keep posted on the Techlahoma website for that. Today, what we're going to go through is first design and design thinking. And this is really what you want to do to get into solving a problem. So we're going to talk about what design is. Then I'm gonna get you some tools and some basic knowledge so that you have something to base everything off of and you're not just in the wild like, what's this design thing, what's going on? And then a workflow. Having a workflow makes it easier for you to go from start to finish. I'll just show you one. There are lots of them and as soon as you get comfortable you can adopt your own with no problems. And we're going to do some small case studies. They're not really case study level, but I'm taking some elements live from the web, and then I'm going to be using those. And then finally, some resources to get you started. I have some books over here. At the end of the talk, you can look through. Those are my recommendations with books. And I really think they can help get you on your way. The slides will be online as well, and any links that I have are on those slides, so don't worry about those either. So now let's go ahead and talk about design and design thinking. These are the basics. This is where we're starting from. And what is design? I would like to say I have the ultimate answer to that, but I don't. There are greater minds than me who still have difficulty talking about it, so I'm just going to give you the basic basic. It's solving problems for humans in a way that can be approached by humans. That's basically it you design lots of different things. Design can mean lots of different things. For example, if I say this podium is well designed, am I talking about the aesthetic? Does it look really good? Or am I talking about how it's really easy to stand behind? Is it a balance between the two? And those are all things that you need to consider whenever you're going through design as well. It's problem solving. And problem solving is really difficult. I wish that I were the strongest being in the world and I had a magical gauntlet that could solve all design problems, could snap my fingers and everything's good, but usually this is what it looks like. That's what you got. So, mm. Thanos, I got you. <laughs> um, let's go ahead with some design thinking. So this is the pattern for design thinking and basically what you're doing is it looks like a straight line. You, empathize with the user. And what empathy and empathizing is, is understanding the problems of the user from the user's perspective. You really wanna know what the user is dealing with, what the issue is, why they're dealing with something. I've had, up till now, lots of problems with math. I'm a full-time software developer and I do lots of things, but math is one of those things that I still can't really break the barrier on. My dad is amazing at math. I don't know why I didn't get any of those genes. Oh well. But when I talk to him about math and I say, I'm having this issue, can you teach me? He says to me, that's easy. 
oh, it's just this, 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 and it's done. And I'm like, uh, okay. And we have this disconnect, and I can't talk to him about math because he isn't able to empathize with me at my point in time with where I'm at, right? However, there are other people who I've talked to about math who say, oh yeah, I remember, I had difficulties with that, and that's how I dealt with it. For example, I had difficulties with programming. I'm like, how come I can't make A equal to X? And now it's not an issue, but I remember that, and I empathize with people who are in that situation. So I understand the problem, and I know how to talk about it. When it comes to design, you want to do the same thing. You want to understand what the user is dealing with. I don't like the page. OK, why don't they like the page? The buttons are all over the place. I understand what the issue is. It's hard to navigate this page. That's where the empathy comes in. So we've empathized with the user. We understand that the buttons are all over the page. That's why they're having difficulty. So now we need to define the problem. The problem is the buttons need to be centrally located. So we go to our next step, ideation, where you go through and you find different ways to solve the problem. And after you've done your ideation, you say, these are a number of ways that I can solve my problem. You make a prototype. This is the thing. This is how we're going to solve it. You test it, and then you're done. Yay, we designed something. We're good to go. Except it doesn't quite work that way. Maybe you get to testing, and you realize at your testing stage that you didn't really understand what the problem was. So you go back because you now empathize with the user. You understand what was going on. You go back and you say, this is what the real problem is. Let's start all the steps again. Or maybe you're testing, and you're like, this, this is good, but I have a better idea of how to make things better. Or you made a prototype, and you're like, wait, this prototype inspired me to do more things. I have more ideas of how I can solve this. And you can keep going that way. Basically, it's not a linear process. Don't think of it as a linear process. You can probably start in the middle. You can start at ideation and then work your way backwards. It's very organic, so don't worry about that. So now we understand design thinking. Now we're going to go to solving the problem. I have concept cars up here. And the cool thing about concept cars is a car can be pretty much anything. They all solve our problem. Our problem, number one problem, is how did you get here? Most likely you had some form of transportation to get right here. And the car solved that problem. We could go back to horses. You could totally get here. That solved the problem for a little bit, but the problem was we wanted to get there faster, safer, with less poop on the streets. So we had invented the car. And the cars have issues too. You no, know, we don't have poop in the streets, but we have stuff in the air now. So there are electric cars. So Whenever you're solving your problems, you have a lot of ways you can do it. We have, for example, the concept car. This one right over here. And that's amazing. Concept cars are awesome because it's like, I can do anything. Look at this. This is the coolest car, and I totally wouldn't want to ride in it because I totally look like a dweeb or something. It's just crazy. But it is a form of design. It's saying, how far can we push the boundaries? When you look at web design, you can say the same thing. How far can I push the boundaries? You're making a portfolio site for yourself. You might want to push those boundaries. They can show that I know the technology, I know what's behind the design, and I know how to push it. So that's one way to solve a problem. We also have over here the luxury car. That is pretty cool. It's precise. It has all the features you need, but it's also unattainable for most of us. I drive a Ford. I'm probably never going to afford a BMW, unfortunately. So it's not quite attainable. It's those services that companies pay $2,000 a month for subscriptions, right? They have a lot of different features. They're really elegant. That's also a way to solve a problem, right? Finally, we have the consumer model right over here. It checks all the boxes. I can get from A to B. It's safe enough. It has enough features for my day-to-day, -day, and it's approachable. I can say, OK, I can buy one of these cars. And that's how you want to look at your designs as well. Who's going to be approaching it? Speaking of which, 
we really want to think about the user's context. What context? Who is the user? What are we trying to do and what is the context? Are they, is this for work? Is this personal? Is it business? Is it casual? That's something you want to think about. Are they on their mobile phones? Are they on their tablets? Or are they working on a desktop? Now, it's very important to think about that because I have an example over here. In the wild, you might want to take a look at this. I like to download sounds and mess with sounds, so I use a program. And I'm not calling this company out, OK? But it's just it works for this presentation. I use something called Splice, and I can download my sounds. And I'm like, well, I have an iPad. I'm going to get the Splice app for my iPad. And a pad, iPad's pretty big. I hold it like this. I want to be at my desk. I want the extra screen real estate. That's why I got one of these big things. And this is what I get. Very cumbersome for me to use, because it was designed to be used on an iPhone. So now I have to use my tablet like an iPhone that it doesn't really work, no. So you want to think about context a lot. That's very, very, very important. Next, we actually want to think about a, an approach to our content. So you're going to be presenting content to the user in some shape or form. There are lots of ways to do it. I'm just going to show you some examples. These are what I've distilled it down to, but there's more. They're hybrids, and there are other applications as well. But first, we might have email. You might make an email message. I'm sure you've all gotten those marketing email messages in your inbox, the responsive emails. They're really well designed. You can apply your web design and HTML skills there. You can also go with a web page. We've all seen them. This is Google way back in the day before they went and did their design overhaul. There's a dashboard where you're presenting metrics to lots of different people, and they want to see everything on one screen in as concise as possible. Next, we also have an app, a full-blown app. And these get really complicated, but it is a way to present content. So we've gone through, we've looked at design. We know what's going on with design, how to start our problem, how to solve it. Now I'm going to give you the basic tools and knowledge so that you know where to go from here, because you can't build something without the tools. You can't build a house without nails, wood, and a lot of other things now. So here are the tools of the trade. We need pen and paper. I recommend graph paper. And you might be wondering, if we're doing digital design, why are we doing everything on paper? Well, the biggest reason we're doing things on paper is because that's the fastest way to get your ideas down. Analog is much faster for so much than digital is. I love tech. I have a ton of computers at home. My wife has to deal with my girlfriend, which are computers. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just I love tech. And the analog way is just faster than dealing with tech a lot of the time. So you want to get comfortable with pen and paper and sketching. If you're not comfortable with sketching, I do have a book that I recommend, and I'll talk about that later. You also want some mock-up and prototyping tools. And the reason that you need these tools are, after you have your sketches down, you want to make them presentable to somebody else. If you can't present them as an idea, if you can't pitch them to somebody, if you can't walk them through, this is how I'm going to build up your website, this is how I'm going to redo your app, this is how we're going to run your marketing campaign, then you can't communicate. So this is a way to start communicating. You want a few web browsers. You want the default on your computer. But you probably also want Firefox and Chrome because people access websites and web media different ways. And a website on one computer might show up slightly different on another. So you want to make sure you have a few to test with. And finally, you want a text editor. And you want to find one that you love. I like Sublime Text 3. I don't recommend it for everybody because there's an upfront cost of like $70. It's really good. There are others that are free as well, like Visual Studio Code, Atom. Those are great ones. And they all support the industry very well. You can do web development across all of them. I recommend ones that are cross-platform. You can use them on Mac or Windows because 
maybe you have a Mac and you're working and you go to a company that only has Windows, well, if it's cross-platform, you can still use your tools. So try and look for cross-platform solutions when possible. Now, we have our tools to make our wireframes, mockups, and our prototypes. Like I said, start lo-fi because drawing in analog is much faster and easier to change. The cost of changing a drawing is a new piece of paper, writing things down really quickly. Hi-fi, hi whenever you go a little bit higher, it takes a little bit more time to go through that because you have to go through and manipulate your elements, change how they are, resize things, and it just takes a little bit more time. And then whenever you're dealing with a full-blown prototype and somebody says, can we shift this to the left 10 pixels? That's when your world is over because changing it at that point in time is really expensive. So try and get everything out in the drawing stage, communicate, lots of sticky notes. There are ways to do this and some of the books that I have actually go through the methodology for how to go through and do your lo-fi drawing up to your prototypes. Next, if you're doing web design, you have to know CSS and how to work with CSS selectors. I had difficulties with this for a little bit, but then I found a plugin for a text editor called Emmet. And what Emmet does is it allows you to write HTML using CSS selectors. And I have an example. I'm going to go ahead and pop that up over here. I just have some text, and let's see if I can see where my cursor is. And you can see right over here, it says table.information, and the dot would be a class in my table, and I have a table row, and then table cells over here, and I have times three down here. And with Emmet, if you have it installed, and it can be installed in any one of those editors I talked about before, you are writing these CSS selectors, and you hit the tab button, and then you get HTML. So it saves you in writing HTML, it saves you in missing closed tags, and it also teaches you CSS selectors at the same time, because that's the way to use the tool. So you're getting three birds with one stone instead of just two, or even one, which is pretty cool. Next. We're going to go to the next slide. Design patterns. So you might be thinking, well, design is amazing, but I've never done it. I don't know how to do it. Well, there are these things called design patterns. And it's common ways to address problems. There are lots of components. So you don't have to start from complete scratch. Basically, going through with these, for example, this is a carousel that you're seeing up on the screen. And they're just ways for you to organize content, manage data input, work with search boxes, autocomplete, drop down boxes, et cetera. Those are all called design patterns. And I have a list over here. There's more as well. And I have links to where you can see more about design patterns. But it's just an easier way to approach it. So you know, oh, if I'm going to make that web page, I need a tab navigation. I'm going to need a few drop down boxes, some text input, and a search field. And by doing that, you simplify the design process because you're not doing everything from scratch from the beginning. Next, you want to understand the basics of responsive design. And with that example with Splice, that wasn't a responsive app. It was made for cell phone, and then they just stretched it. So if I had a tablet that was this big, I would have to hold it like this. It's very cumbersome. It just it doesn't make sense. But with responsive design, what you're doing is saying people are going to approach content from different devices in different ways. I need to make sure that my content adapts to their device, and I don't need to force them to adapt to my content. This has been around for a while. It's a very good approach to design for the web and for apps and software as well. Jumping into it straight off is difficult. So I recommend that you jump into a front-end framework of some sort. I recommend Foundation. I've used it. It's really great. They've been around for a long time. It's very simple, easy to read. Bootstrap is also very good. Bulma and Skeleton are good as well. And you might wonder, like, in the day and age that we have the CSS grid, 
why would I need a front-end framework? Well, it's a more approachable way to get your design up and running from the beginning, and you don't have to fight with it as much. And the CSS grid is really good. If you're in a company that's working from scratch on a new system, I would recommend using the CSS grid because the company owns all of that and you can tailor it to your needs. However, if you're making your own web page or you're working on a web page for somebody else and it just needs to be up there and you want it to be responsive and you don't want to have to put in all the work of customizing all the different controls, I most definitely recommend a front-end framework. Next, let's take a look at a workflow. So we need to figure out how we're going to work through things to get from start to finish. And this is usually how you go through it. You do a rough pass, you do a prototyping pass, and then you do a finishing pass. So your rough pass is basically doing all your sketches. And these are some sketches I did. They're not good, they're just, I sketched on paper, I used the graph paper to help me draw straight lines, otherwise I can't draw straight lines. So that's why I recommend graph paper. Lots of notes, arrows, like this is where I want it to go, this is, if you click here, this is where it goes to. That's what you're thinking about whenever you're in the paper prototyping stage. That's really what you want to do. Sketch a lot. Just keep sketching. As soon as you're like, I'm done sketching for today, that's about when you should stop. But keep sketching until you hit that. After you've hit that point, take a break. Take a breather. Go someplace, listen to some music, play some video games, do something else, whatever floats your boat. Come back with a fresh mind and then start transitioning your sketches over to using digital tools. So like a mock-up tool. Basomic mock-ups is really good. It looks very 1990s, but that's perfect because you don't want your mock-ups to be too hi-fi. There's also Adobe XD, and I would recommend that for prototyping, not as much for mock-ups because when you're in XD, you start talking colors and fonts and everything, and it's too early for that. You really want to stay lo-fi, everything rough, so that you have the freedom to change things around. Next, we go into prototyping. This is where you would jump into Adobe XD and what are my colors and what do I do. So you'd have a hi-fi uh, a hi-fi sketch, like I have over here. I did that in Balsamic, and I just click a button and it becomes hi-fi. And then you might want to start looking at colors. What am I going to do with colors? You might make a mood board. And a mood board can be a collection, it's an eclectic collection of lots of things together that says, this is the mood we're going for. This is kind of what we want our finished product to look like, feel like, and be. And at the beginning, starting off and jumping into a mood board, mood board can seem very daunting, but there are easy ways to get there, and I'm going to show you one. First, you can see that this one has five colors. I have five color swatches. And there's an easy way to get here. We can go ahead and on this screen, I have Adobe Color CC. And what it does is it allows you to get colors from a picture or start with your own color palette. So you can go in and if I navigate over there, make sure I'm there, you can move these colors around and it's going to try and, based on a color you choose, it gives you complementary colors or other colors that might match. Now what I like to do is, with your mood board, you might be looking on the internet for pictures like I had in mine. So you get a picture and you tell color that you're going to start from an image. I have Avengers images over here. Apparently I like the Avengers. Let's go ahead and take a look at what happens if we toss Tony Stark Iron Man in here. Awesome. And it goes through and it makes a color palette for us. It's that easy. And obviously, as you go into doing more design, there are going to be intricacies that you're going to have to deal with. But starting out for just a five-tone color theme, you can do something like this. I got Iron Man over here. These colors look pretty OK. I might need to use white as the text color if I'm going to use black as the background and then the other colors as trim or buttons. Over there, that works. Sometimes you might toss a picture in and it just doesn't work. Let's see what else we have. I have Spider-Man from the 10th anniversary. Let's go ahead and 
yeah, that really doesn't work. It's, no. And it happens. But you can go through, and there are other ways to navigate around. You can, I might not be able to see it over here. This is back to the wheel. And that is back to my image. Let's try the Hulk. That's OK. You could go ahead and choose styles, and that changes it. So you can change it like, oh, that's better. I could probably work with that and do something with it. So that's a good way to go ahead and start choosing your colors. So back to prototyping, we also want to talk about fonts just a little bit. So you see I have some fonts that I just decided to mess with. I'm like, OK, how can I match these fonts? I have a really bold slab style font, and then I have a sans Sarah style font over here that I tossed in as well. And we can work with that. There are tools to work with that as well. My goal is to get you the tools to start working with them instead of being afraid of them. And one way you can do that is we can do a web search. And this is a web page. I just typed in font pairings. 20 perfect font pairings. So other people who are really, really into typography went through and said, if you pair these fonts, depending on what you're doing, you should be pretty OK. And you can just scroll through and see some font pairings and say, oh, these are some fonts that I want to go through. And it's good to know what a sans serif font is and what a serif font is at the beginning. And as you go over time, you'll get more in depth and understanding what's going on. But yeah, we'll scroll down. And I think over here at number nine is what I wanted to use. There's the liberation serif and sans serif. And as you can see, the serif font has little flares at the ends. And the, serif, the sans serif font is very flat and straight. That's pretty much the difference. And they said that you can pair these. So we might want to use the serif font as a header and then the sans serif for our body. And one way you can do that is we are going to go on to Google Fonts. And you can choose some fonts. We, I typed in lib ahead of time. So they don't exactly have the fonts that were there, but they have some things that are pretty close. These two right over here, they are fairly close. Let's go ahead and see if I can add them. So you would add it like this. And then it gives you the CSS and the link for actually tossing that into some place. Now, there's one more tool on top of that that I would want to use after we've had our font selected. And I have some other things going on on my screen right now so that I can show you what's going on. There is a tool called Grid Lover. And in Grid Lover, you can experiment with fonts. So it has the font here. And you can use the little buttons up at the top to navigate between the different panels. Here's the link panel where you'd put your link text. Let me get my link text so that it will talk to the Google font provider. And you will get those two fonts that we looked at over there. So I can paste them in. And I paste them in here. That's awesome. And I said that I would use one for the body and one for the header. So for the body, where you, uh, for the header, we're using the serif font. Have that over here. And I've copied the code for that. And I'm going to try and paste these in here. There we go. I'm going to paste that there. We can see it changes. So you can start working with fonts that way. That's another header. And we can just see how it works with our headers. That's a little too big. We might want to reduce that. But just to show you, for example. So that is an example of what we did with these serif headers. And then we can also toss in our sans serif body as well to see how that changes things. And I would encourage you to use this tool and experiment with it so that you can see what's going on with your designs. So let's go with the body. This is what we have over here. And I'm going to change it with the code from Google fonts. And that's how it changes it. So you can experiment this way. You don't have to set up a web page. You can just go to this web page, toss on font combinations, see what you think, and see how you like them. Very, very handy. 
Awesome. Next, we're going to go to polishing up your work. So we've already talked about deciding on some fonts and thinking about font pairings and how to work with the fonts. You also want to reduce image sizes. You're working with somebody who has a cell phone. They're downloading a web page. I'm sure we've all had it. How many of you have had a web page that just takes forever to load on your phone? Everyone? OK. A lot of times what's happening is they gave you the desktop version of the image, and your phone is trying to download all of that. It wastes your bandwidth on your phone. It takes up your packets or whatever you use per month, and it's also slow. So you want to find ways to reduce it. It's called responsive images. And there are lots of ways that you can deal with it. I recommend you go and search for using responsive images and responsive designs to get started with that. You also want to leverage an icon pack. And the reason that you want to go with an icon pack is instead of going through and designing each and every one of these icons right here, that takes a long time. There are icon designers out there that that's all they do. They make icons so that you can use them. Get one of those, toss them in your design, you can color them using CSS. It's very handy and it saves you time. So once again, the whole design thing is you don't have to do everything with design, you just need to know how to combobulate if that's a word, discombobulates a word, <laughs> the different parts of design so that you can get what you want to work with. OK, let's go ahead and take a look at some case studies. We have all the information that I've given you so far, and I'm going to give you some more information. Whenever it comes to design, like where do I put something? How should I color it? What do I want it to be? How would the user perceive it? There are lots of ways to find out how to analyze that. One way is gestalt principles. It's a really big word for principles of good figure, or how to make something look good. I've put four of them up here. I think they're close to 15 thereabouts. And sometimes they're called laws. Other, other times they're called principles. Really, they're just good rules of thumb, because there's always ways to break them. But basically, we have the law of proximity. That means. If things are close together, they feel like a group. Two people are walking down the street, and there's a huge gap between them. They're like, oh, there are two people walking down the street. There's a guy and a girl walking down the street, and they're shoulder to shoulder. Like, oh, OK, maybe they're together or something. Law of proximity, how close things are together. The law of similarity, things that look the same act the same. And this works for buttons links. Anytime we see a web page, we're like, links are blue, usually. And when you hover over them, it the, gives you the little hand icon. And we've learned that. So anytime we see something similar, we're like, I can click it. Clicky thing. I can click it. There's also figure ground distinction where the figure, like me right now, is what you want to focus on, and the ground is what's behind. This is what's behind me. If I wanted to blend in, so that you guys couldn't see me, I would probably wear a suit that looks like this, and then I'd stand back here, and then you'd see a floating head, but you wouldn't see the rest of me. And that's how we can kind of talk about figure-to-ground distinction. Right? You can see me really well because I'm wearing a black shirt against a white background. There's also law of common region, where things that are, share the same border feel like a group. So if they're in the same boundary, the same border, they feel like a group. That's law of common region. Let's go ahead and take a look at these in the wild. First one over here, this is a, an email that I got from Sentry. I use Sentry for logging what's going on on my web servers. It sends me messages about all the people from foreign countries trying to hack into my computer and do bad stuff about it. That's why there's the failed password and valid user thing over there. And it sends it to me. And you can see that we can see some of these laws. So the law of proximity. These info messages are close together. They kind of seem like they are together. We see the law of common region. There's a line dividing this. This area is for the logo. This area is for the type of alert. And down here is for just a few action buttons. And because of that hor horizon line, that's what we see. We also see the law of similarity. The blue things, they look clicky. So I think I can click on them, which is awesome. And you can click on those as well. Also, it's a little bit hard to see on 
the projector, but the background for this email is light gray on gray, which is back over here. And it's a subdued color, which doesn't draw attention to itself. And because the white is so st steady and stable, you're drawn to the white. So that's a way to group it. There's also a border around the whole message saying, this is the content, the background is just the background. Here's another one, we have a dashboard. And we can see the laws at play over here. We have the law of proximity, all the metrics are close together. The foreground is really bright, the background is dark. You're not, a tr you're not really drawn to the um, background. It's a bluish, slate blue, navy blue, thereabouts, and you're not really drawn to it because everything on the front is really bright. It jumps out at you, the bright blues. You're seeing that, the red when the numbers and the metrics. Cards, cards are a design pattern, and you're seeing cards over here. Cards really encompass the law of common region. It's a region around what you're looking at that says this data together is all together. That's a way to group it. I wanna group these things so that you see that this is a group, this is how it works. Using cards as well is a really great way to get into responsive design because cards move around. They're really easy to move around. Next, let's take a look at a page. So this is Typekit, kind of like Google Fonts. And Typekit over here, we can see law of proximity, they give you lots of generous space between the different elements. And then the elements that are together, they put them really close. So they really exaggerate the extremes over there. That's what they're doing. That's what they're trying to do to go through that. And the law of similarity. Well, we have clicky things once again. The green looks clicky. The buttons, you can click on them. Anything that's rounded, square, looks like an action button. I can action it. I can click on that and do something with that. That's really cool. And finally, we have an app, Instagram. The law, of common re uh, the law of figure ground distinction is really prominent here because the picture jumps out at you and the rest of Instagram is kind of not really there. That's the point. They want you to scroll. They want you to see more pictures. So the pictures, vivid, everything else, eh, you can pass it over. The action buttons are wireframe. And once again, they probably went with wireframe because they don't want to draw attention to it as much. And that's one thing that you can do, but they're wireframed, but you can tell they're action buttons because all of the action-y buttons are very similar. So that's it. I think I should talk about white space, but instead I'm gonna talk about Japanese bento boxes. I love Japanese food. I was in Japan for a long time. I was there eight years. And you see bento boxes everywhere. This is a bento box. I love it. It has my fish stuff, where fish stuff should be. It's separated from the sour, sweet tasting stuff and my wasabi stuff, because I don't want that on my rice. And they're all separated. We got the sushi stuff up here. They're all separate compartments. I know where everything goes. It goes in its place. They're awesome. Oh, we got a super packed bento box over here. We got separators in there. That's a separator. Sushi stuff fish stuff, they're all separated. The juices from the different types of food aren't gonna flow into each other, so when I eat my shrimp, it tastes like shrimp, it doesn't taste like pickles. I don't like pickles. Pretty good stuff. There's another bento box, four squares, very geometric. And you got your food stuff and your rice stuff, and then over here we got stuff in stuff in stuff. Man, you can really put regions around these things. And finally, high class bento box. I got containers for your containers for your containers for your containers. You've seen web pages like this. They're doing it to help separate things, put things in boundaries. I guess what I'm saying is, if you take a look at design, web design, well done web design, you might see some bento boxes. This morning I was fortunate to make a bento box for my wife. This is it, I took a picture, I'm like, I'm tossing that on my slide this morning. That's it, it's got the rice stuff and the cheesy stuff and the cold stuff to the side and then you pack that up and you got your Avengers again. There we go, awesome. So if you go ahead and take a look at design, bam, that's a bento box. I should have changed the colors. 
That's terrible design. You could scold me. <laughs> Red on black on a projector, that is terrible. On the computer, you could see it. Over here, you can't. But yeah, you see that. That's a bento box. We got another bento box over here. We got the red and the things and the things. And we got ourselves another bento box. And yet one more bento box. They're all bento boxes. Good design, good spacing, good white space, bento boxes. Awesome. So now let's go ahead and I'm going to give you some resources and some ideas for you to go ahead and start moving forward. First, if you have a chance, I think you should go through and look through some grid systems. Grid systems are really good, especially if you're going to be working with the CSS grid directly. You need to understand grid systems and how they work. If you're working with a front-end framework, not so much. You can just start going. But eventually, you're going to travel to grid systems. So take a look at that. There are lots of different ones. You want to browse through a design system. If you want to go to sleep at night and you're having trouble sleeping, actually look through a design system. I know I'm not, that's not good PR for design systems, but they're like 300-page documents of how you should make your application fit the standards of Apple or Microsoft or Google. They have tidbits and gems in there. Go through, take a look, skim, find the gems. The rest you can leave it unless you actually have to conform to all of the standards for that platform. Also, take a look at dark theme trends. Right now, we're seeing a lot of dark themes all over the place because people don't want to get their retinas burnt out looking at white screens all the time. For today's talk, I used a bright screen on my text editor, but usually it's really dark. You come into where I work, it's really dark. My coworkers are like, you're so dark. I'm like, I'm a black man, I'm dark. I got a black shirt, I'm dark, and I wear black. So, dark trend. And then we have Jennifer DeWalt, 180 page, um, pages in 180 days project. You should check her project out. She spent one day making a web page, each day getting progressively more difficult. It is awesome. And she made lots of mistakes. She left them out in the wild, in the open for you to see. It's a very good attitude to have to say, I'm going to try something, and even if I fail, I don't care if other people see it. She got 180 pages, and you could see her skill increasing as she went on. She started with, this is text on a page, to this is how you upload an image to my web page. People did bad stuff with the images, so be careful. Uh, then it went from that to, this is a random text generator, to lots of things. And she just kept going. Please check out her project. It's on GitHub. And you can also see her blog and her web page. Finally, some books. These are some of the books I recommend. Steve Krug's Don't Make Me Think is a great way to get into usability, UX design, user research, and just the whole process that I talked about here. If you're looking at learning how to sketch, I'm not going to say learning how to draw, because as soon as you say draw, you start thinking amazing art. And we don't need to go that far. You just need to ha have enough to get it done. This shows you how to get it done. It gives you some exercises and practice that you can do every day to improve your sketching. Look at stick figures a different way. She made some awesome stick figures in it. I have these books here, by the way, so that after the talk, you can come see me, look through them. If it's something you're interested, you can go online and get the books. Next is Design for Hackers. If you're really into programming, you're like, I'm a programmer, programmer, and I'm not going to do design because I don't understand design. It doesn't make sense. You can go through, read this book. It has some good information for you. It goes into depth on a lot of the things that I've already talked about, but in ways that make sense to people who came from a programming perspective. And then finally, thinking with type. This is a dense book. If you're like, I want to know everything about typography, this is where to start. If you want to read a book cover to cover and then find good references about how to use typography, this is a good book. It is really dense, though. Just a word of warning. We also have some online resources. A lot of the talk came from these resources that you can get at the Interaction Design Foundation. The design process, they go into depth on that. The glossary of human-computer interaction, that's a glossary of things that you need to know 
when talking with other industry professionals about how to talk about how users interact with your pages. They also have the link to the Gestalt principles that I talked about. Next, Travis D, Travis D Media, and they have a video on Emmet, how to use Emmet as a way to start learning CSS and how to speed up writing HTML. And finally, the Zurb Foundation Grid. You can go and check out that video. It shows you how to use a front-end framework. Bootstrap, you just do a search for Bootstrap. You can find Bootstrap up there as well. And you'd be good to go. That's it. I'm going to open it up for any questions, if anybody has any. Yes? OK, so the question was, a good place to go to find information about how to design for usability using your product and how to make things usable for users. For example, people who might have problems seeing with like colorblind, green, red, green yeah. issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hearing impairments where you'd be using the ARIA tags in your HTML. A good place to start would probably be the uh, Nelson Norman website by Don Norman, he wrote a book called The Design of Everyday Things. It is a really good book. He talked about his struggles with everything. He went to Europe and things were backwards and kept on running into doors. He tried to open doors that wouldn't work. And his group does research on usability. He also helps with the Interaction Design Foundation because that's all what they do. So I would go to Nisa Norman first because Don Norman did a lot of work there and then you can start going out from there. Good question. Anyone have anything else? And there are a bunch of resources. I don't have them here on my computer right now, but if afterwards you give me your information, I can send them your direction as well. Because there are checkers that can check to make sure that the contrast on your web pages is enough that you can see them so that you don't run into that mistake that I had on the projector with red on black. It's good to make mistakes because you can teach people. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well thank you very much.